Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Uh, so my name is Alex Liu, and I work at Netflix. Today I'll be telling a story about how uh, we at Netflix use DynamoDB uh, to really enable A-B testing at uh, the scale that we need to. So at Netflix, I work on the Node.js platform team. And we do everything from building libraries to services in support of our UI and product teams. Uh, so you know, if you happen to love Netflix, you love streaming, you love working on large-scale systems, you know, please come find me afterward. I'd love to chat. OK, so Netflix. Uh, is there anybody who doesn't know who we are? Somebody who is living under, underneath the rock for the last 10 years? Um, so we are, at this point, an online video streaming service. And we are the fine purveyor of a lot of original content these days. Uh, what's pretty amazing is that I think we're now in over 190 plus countries with over 100 million subscribers, which to me is still kind of insane because you know I think back like 10 years ago and we were still getting really excited to see these uh, red envelopes show up in our mailbox. That is, of course, you know until you see this because your your mailman decided to like stuff it in the mail slot and crack the DVD, uh, which is always great. All right, uh, so the story that I'm going to share with you guys today is um, going to be split into four parts. So I'll kind of start by setting the stage uh, of the problem, right, and talking about what exactly we were trying to solve. Uh, I'll then kind of follow that um, by talking about you know, how we solve this particular problem at Netflix by building a service and you know, some of the scaling problems associated with that service. And finally, end with some of the things that keep us up at night. The problem. So every great story starts with a problem. And at its core, our problem was really about building JavaScript bundles at Netflix. Uh, and if you've been in the front end space for a long time, or you've been doing this for a while, you've probably seen this space evolve a lot over the last, well, really since the uh, beginning of time. So you know, we probably started doing this by you know, using cat on the command line to concatenate a bunch of JavaScript files. But now we've got fancy tools like Browserify and Webpack. Uh, so we can kind of take a look at you know, what a typical example might look like. So if you've got a JavaScript application with an entry point here called home.js, you might have some dependencies here, right? foo and bar. And each of these dependencies are going to have their own dependencies. And you end up having uh, this dependency graph for your application. Now, of course, as your website grows, you're probably going to have different pages, right? So you're going to have like a home page, a profile page. And each of the pages are going to have their own dependency graph. So as a developer, it might be really easy to say, like, look, I've got all these JavaScript, JavaScript files. I'm just going to bundle them all up into a single thing, send them down for all my users. Um, but it's probably not great, right? Um, you know, presumably, you've got a bunch of stuff that only your home page is using that your profile page doesn't need. So you know, we typically tend to split these up at a top level. Now, what about you know, supporting older browsers like IE, right? Uh, a lot of us have felt the pain of having to support older browsers like this. And so you know, with uh, older IE versions, you don't really get the support for, say, a lot of the fancy HTML5 or even ES5 or ES6 features. So what we'll typically do is ship our JavaScript bundles with shims, right? You have shims or libraries that kind of enable, uh, enable you to use these newer features. Now, of course, these shims can be big in size, so you don't really want to send those down for users who aren't on IE. So what we probably might do then is, you know, as a request comes in, take a look at the user's browser and say, look, uh, are you using a version of IE? If so, then you know, I'm going to give you the IE version of this uh, bundle. And if not, then I'll just give you the regular version that supports all your other fancy stuff. Now, because we're Netflix, uh, let's make this a little bit more complicated. So we love to do A-B testing. Uh, frequently, we'll deliver different variations of the same thing, really just in order to test and see you know, which one is the best experience for our users. And so here's a super simple, simple example of what one of our tests might look like. So these are box shots for a particular video. Um, and what we might do is you know, the UX is pretty much exactly the same except for this image. And we'd run this test and find out that, hey, look, uh, the image in cell two actually increased engagement with our users. So great, uh, image two becomes the new default image. Um, and that's now what uh, users would get. Now, that's a pretty simple example. But the reality is uh, we test a ton of other things, right? So we will play with, say, uh, the placement of the buttons, what they look like. We'll play with sort of the ordering of your rows. And we even do a lot of testing around core features of the site. So if you look at something like search, right, that's an integral part of the site's experience. Uh, so let's take a look at what it might look like if we were to A-B test the search experience. 
So we've got our home page, right? And maybe we've got our two variations. We've got an old search experience and a new search experience. Now, if you get the old search experience, then really, ideally, you would get just the dependencies required for your old search experience, right? Um, and likewise, if you're in new search, then you should only get the dependencies required for new search. Now, uh, when a user asks for this home homepage JavaScript bundle, uh, it's super easy for us as, as developers to basically say, look, um, I'm just going to bundle all of these things and send them down, right? But in this case, what if, say, the new search experience uses a different framework, right? Uh, we see this a lot in migrations where perhaps in this case, new search is using React and the old search version was using jQuery. So now we're actually sending a ton of stuff uh, that we don't really need, right? Uh, and these increased file sizes are pretty bad. For our end users, it's a lot like getting hit by a truck, right? Bigger file sizes mean that we end up taking more time to download more stuff that we don't really need. Um, and ultimately, you know, that increases memory usage and increases time to interactive. So for folks who aren't familiar with the concept of time to interactive, it's really the amount of time that it requires for you know, the client to really parse and load the JavaScript, um, bootstrap the application, and basically be ready to interact um, with the user. So in many ways, TTI is one of the holy grail metrics for the uh, user experience. So who remembers these old school Legos? I know this is uh, kind of what I grew up with. Uh, so if you bought a bucket of, uh, usually you'd buy like this giant bucket of a thousand pieces and they're all pretty generic uh, bricks. And uh, you, know, you have to use your imagination to actually build something useful and fun. Fast forward you know, a couple decades, this is what you get when you go walk into the Lego store now, right? Um, Lego sets are really no longer the generic sets of yours. Instead, they're highly specialized, right? Um, and each set really only comes with the pieces that you need. And so since these sets are so specialized now, it really wouldn't make any sense, for example, to say, you know, bundle Harry Potter bricks with your Star Wars set, because there's just no way for you to reasonably make use of those pieces. And that's, in fact, exactly the same thing that uh, we're looking at here for our JavaScript bundles, right? You know, each experience is highly specialized, and you know, we want to make sure that if you're in old search, you only get the things you need, and if you're in new search, you only get the things that you want. And so since search is such an integral part of the experience, you know, we do want to make sure that, OK, we, we further split that up, right? Um, so you, as you can see, this is starting to get a little bit unwieldy, so we've got you know, different variations of uh, new search with IE, without IE, old search with IE, without IE. Um, and this is just for a single page, right, for just the home page. So if you multiply this out across all the different uh, entry points you've got on your website, this starts to get a little bit um, difficult to manage. Now, the thing is, we actually run hundreds of A-B tests a year. Uh, a lot of these tests run concurrently. Um, and so it actually starts to get pretty uh, crazy. Because we also uh, do testing or you know, variations on the UI based on other dimensions. And so other dimensions, for example, can include things like your geolocation. Um, it can be based on the features of your particular client. In this case, I've got uh, icons for browsers. But the same thing applies if you're using any of our 10-foot devices, so like you know, TVs, embedded devices, et cetera. So if anybody remembers uh, their math here, the total number of possible combinations really is equal to the number of items in each set multiplied by each other. Uh, so if we were to run, say, 100 A-B tests with just three variations each, this is you know, the total number of possible variations we're talking about uh, in the UI. So this is a pretty big number. I'm not gonna even, I don't even know how I would possibly pronounce this. So let's uh, try to visualize that a little bit. You know, like Big numbers are abstract and kind of hard to digest. So according to Lego's own website, it takes about 40 billion bricks you know, laid on top of each other to reach the moon. Uh, it takes about 7.6 quadrillion bricks to reach Pluto. And this number is actually still less than the number that we just saw. So if we were to take that number uh, and divide it by the number of times it gets to Pluto, we can actually go to Pluto this many times. Um, so that's a really, really big number. And it's just a lot of bundles, right? So all right, that's kind of a problem. What are we going to do? Uh, I'm sure there's some joke here about compiling for a scripting language that I can't quite put my finger on. So instead, uh, here's the infamous uh, XKCD comic about you know, compiling. 
so it's not just that the developers have to feel this pain, right, uh, waiting for compilation times. You know, the fact is the full size of just our website's JavaScript, if you include the entire repository, you know, is eight megabytes plus, right? So even if we wanted to, we couldn't send all that down to, um, to our clients and to the browser, because it would just absolutely kill the user experience. Great, so at this point, the problem is pretty clear. Uh, how do we deal with conditional dependencies, right? In other words, users should only get certain files if they meet certain conditions. Um, whether that condition happens to be allocated to an A-B test, you know, using the right client or something or other. Um, and we need to be able to solve this problem while continuing to move fast within the UI. So as part of approaching this problem, uh, we kind of had to rethink some of our assumptions, right? You know, common sense says if I want to generate a JavaScript bundle, I compile it, I build it offline beforehand, probably publish it to CDN afterward, and then that's where our uh, clients would go and fetch it, right? But as we saw, we can't really reasonably pre-generate all the possible combinations. So what if we instead were to build these on demand, right? You know, if you look at Larry, our barista here, you know, he at coffee shops, they don't make all the coffee that they need for the entire day at the beginning of the day, right? Rather, they take orders, they make the coffee as they come in. So I think this is you know, a pretty good analogy for what we might be able to do here. What if instead we just compiled and built the bundles as they were requested? So let's kind of think through what it would require to actually make this happen. So step one, of course, would be to make sure that we have built the full dependency graph for your application. And that includes all the conditional points that uh, we are talking about. So let's visualize this. You know, if we've got our Git repository here, um, what we did was basically send it through some JavaScript tooling that we built. And we called this, uh, this ecosystem of tooling codex. And what would come out on the other end is this JSON artifact. And you can think of this JSON artifact as a build artifact of sorts, right? Internally, it is a representation of your application's dependency graph. But we would also, through you know, some static analysis and whatnot, be able to determine which edges in this graph are conditional, right? Um, so whether or not it's gated by a particular A-B test or gated by a particular device type, um, et cetera. So the red arrows here uh, would represent those conditional edges. Now, of course, we can create as many artifacts as we need to, right? Over time, teams are going to continue to release new builds, um, and they'll have different artifacts for each of these builds. So in many ways, we can kind of think of these artifacts as like a binary of sorts for our UI, right? By just having one particular artifact, we're able to then generate all the different you know, possible permutations of a dependency graph for that specific build. So now that we've you know, got a way to basically represent what this dependency graph and the conditional edges look like, um, we need to find a way now to evaluate the dynamic inputs. Uh, and so the dynamic inputs are basically what we were talking about um, earlier in terms of the different ways in which we identify a particular user and the experience that they should get. So as I mentioned before, we use a lot of different inputs here. And you know, earlier we saw examples where we were just using IE as uh, one way to differentiate the experience. But you know, here we've got, as I mentioned before, geolocation, your device types, you know, all the different various A-B tests. Um, in fact, we do a lot of things like, say, your membership um, status and your membership state as well to uh, kind of personalize your experience. Now, we can take all of these different inputs and really distill them down into a single bucket. And uh, internally, we call this bucket of flags truths. And conceptually, uh, it's like a grab bag set of sort of Boolean flags that we use to tailor your experience. And here's an example of what a set of truths might look like for a particular uh, team. So they might you know, have defined these things. And what you'll see here is a bunch of key value Boolean pairs that sort of specify the features or experiences that should um, represent that particular user's experience. And what you'll notice here is that the flags that are shown here don't really match one-to-one -to, -one to any of the things that we saw earlier, right? There's no mention of browser or geolocation here. Um, and that's because you know, the raw inputs are mapped into these final, input, final outputs. And these, from the perspective of building the UIs, right, it really abstracts away you know, sort of those raw inputs. Instead, you know, we focus on building our UIs using just a set of you know, conditions or features. So what that means is for a given user, no matter you know, which device they are using or where they're coming from, they're going to get an experience that's tailored just for them. 
OK, so you know, with our truths, we now have a way to kind of represent what a user's experience should get. And as we saw earlier with the artifacts, we have a way to represent the dependency graph. So final, the final step here would really be to apply those truths to the conditional graph here. So let's kind of see what that looks like. Now, typically, uh, in practice, you know, if a user comes to our website, this is how you might expect it to look like, right? Uh, the website serves a script tag. The user's browser or client is going to say, great, I've got this resource. I'm going to go fetch it from Akamai, um, probably because we pre-published it there. Um, but instead, since we are doing this generation on demand, uh, instead, let's have Akamai kind of forward that traffic back to Netflix. Uh, so in effect, the codec service that we've built serves as the origin for the CDN. Now, here's where things start to get a little bit interesting. So if you see that URL I've got at the top here, um, it's kind of a templatized uh, URL, right? And there's some metadata that's baked into that URL that really tells us which artifact is being requested. So if you remember, you know, we had those uh, examples earlier where a website was building all these different you know, versions of their artifacts. Basically, we're saying, hey, look, this URL is asking for the website at version one. And then based on that, uh, you'll also notice the, the last part of that URL contains sort of a comma uh, delimited list of the truths. Um, so by just having this URL, we're now able to know, look, the user is asking for this particular version of a UI given these particular truths. Um, and that actually pretty much gives us all the information that we need to go on. So with these truths, we can now kind of apply it to the dependency graph. So if these were the truths that were path, passed to us in the URL, uh, you know, we look at our entry point and we say, look, OK, great. Immediately, we know we have a, sort of a fork here, right? We either serve the new search experience or we search, uh, sorry, we serve the new search experience or the old search experience. And by looking at the truth, we see that old search is true, which means automatically we stop walking you know, the new search edge of this graph, and we only go down the old search. And you'll notice immediately we get all of the dependencies and transitive dependencies up until the next conditional dependency. So we've got a conditional dependency here that says foo, uh, and as we see in the URL, foo is true, which means, great, we've unlocked this edge, we'll continue walking. Uh, and now we've got another conditional edge that says you need bar to continue going down that path. Well, we don't have the bar truth here, right? Um, so we stop walking, and great. This is pretty much you know, all the dependencies that are required to uh, ship to the user. Now, if you were to compare that to you know, the size of the full graph of all the things that could possibly exist in this entry point, you know, it's a pretty big difference, right? We've effectively cut out half of that graph by doing sort of a runtime resolution of the graph. Um, and so you're probably thinking, all right, if you're doing this at runtime, it's probably going to be a little bit slow, right? Um, and the thing is, I think the proof is in the pudding. We've spent a lot of time optimizing this, and we've been able to you know, get the times down to less than 70 milliseconds, I think, for like the P P90 or P95 plus uh, times for building these JavaScript bundles, which means you know, as the request comes back to origin, we're able to cobble this up together and send a response out all you know, within 70 milliseconds. So it's worked out pretty quickly for us. Um, and it's great, because I think as, as we continue to make optimization, optimizations against this, um, it'll only get quicker. Um, and so one thing that I did forget to mention here is what's also great about the system is that you know, all the state is captured within that URL that we see, right? The URL specifies the UI version, it specifies the truth, it specifies the entry point. You know, it's completely stateless. Like, uh, it allows our system to be stateless and basically cobble together the URL based on just, sorry, cobble together the bundle based on just the URL alone. So of course, now that we've uh, kind of cobbled together that bundle, we send it back out to Akamai who then caches it you know, at the CDN for future requests. And um, that's, that's it, pretty much it. So awesome. Uh, we've now got this really novel service uh, that we use to generate bundles on demand, right? So we've saved our UI teams a ton of compilation time, which is pretty great. Uh, we also have to make sure that this works at Netflix scale. 
So in addition to supporting the website, we do have to support various other teams as well. Right? So you think about the TV UI teams, which are responsible for building the UIs for all of the template devices that you're familiar with. So the TVs, embedded devices, PS4s, Xboxes, et cetera, et cetera. And so thinking about the, all the different customers that we have to support and all the different versions of artifacts that we need to support, very quickly became clear to us that we were talking about a problem of build management. You know, specifically, there were two big questions that uh, we needed to answer. And the first was, like, uh, where do we store these artifacts, right? Teams are going to basically be generating artifacts and um, storing, needing a place to kind of store these long term, right? Because if they're effectively uh, binary, we almost want to have like, an artifactory of sorts for these codex artifacts that we've generated. Uh, question number two would be, how do we find these stored artifacts? And this question kind of implicitly expands the scope of the problem, because now not only do we need to keep track of you know, the raw artifacts themselves, but we also have to keep track of some metadata regarding these artifacts, like the, you know, the team owner of these artifacts, uh, what are the versions of these artifacts, um, and probably you know, something like a pointer to where, wherever we end up storing these artifacts. So what this meant is that we needed to take on additional external dependencies for our service. Uh, we needed a persistent store um, to basically store all these artifacts, but then also a place to store the metadata for these artifacts. Taking on external dependencies is not something we took lightly. Uh, Codex is, or was and is a mission critical service, um, which means that you know, if Codex goes down, then customers would be unable to stream. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know, even some of the nicest people that I know, you wouldn't like them when they don't have the Netflix. So uh, you know, we got to make sure that you know, our service is resilient to all possible uh, failures. So being very thoughtful about this, but you know, also being big customers of Amazon AWS, it kind of really uh, made sense to just rely on core AWS services like S3 and DynamoDB. And one of the really big drivers for our team was that we didn't want to be in the business of owning or running the infrastructure for either of these needs. Uh, you know, it wasn't part of our team's charter, and it certainly wasn't part of uh, you know, our team's kind of expertise. So it made a lot of sense to rely on Amazon here, uh, especially the fact that you know, these are fully managed services. And in effect, what we really wanted was just you know, something that would work. Uh, so S3 as our storage layer was, you know, this is pretty straightforward, right? I don't think there's a whole lot more here I need to say that, you know, hasn't been well trodden. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, S3 provided everything that we needed um, in addition to being effectively infinite in terms of storage space. Now, I think uh, one of the kind of bonuses here was the fact that we had a native Node.js client available to us because we were building this codec service in Node.js. So uh, this was a big win for us. Now, when it came to our metadata needs, you know, uh, NoSQL is really what we were after here. You know, we didn't have a need for really complex joins or sorts or queries of that sort. You know, sim simple queries were really what ruled the day here. And so while there are a lot of other you know, NoSQL solutions out there, none of them really ticked off all the checkboxes of like, a fully managed solution the same way that DynamoDB did. Um, and you know, even in turn at Netflix, you might say, like, well, um, surely there are other teams that are running data stores. And um, you know, it's true, they were. But again, we didn't have access to a native Node.js client here. So I think uh, by Amazon providing this, that was a big win for us. Now, one of the really big killer features here was actually the streams feature of DynamoDB, which uh, you know, would basically emit changes made to uh, your tables. So it would you know, be able to create an event stream and say, like, look, here are the records that are being changed, um, and here's how they changed. And that specific feature was something that we're really interested in, because it would really, really help us build out the system um, as we wanted, which we'll see in just a moment. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out, um, but we'll, we'll kind of see how that played out. Now, a quick note on the availability. So um, I know Amazon doesn't technically publish an availability SLA for DynamoDB, but does anybody here like run their own Cassandra clusters? Very few, like one or two? OK. How, how many times has, has Cassandra gone down for you guys like in the last five or six years? Nothing? All right. Well, all I know is that DynamoDB, for uh, as far as you know, is publicly available. I, I believe has only had a single outage since 
Um, it was introduced in 2012. So you know, for me, that's a pretty, pretty big win. And you know, take it for what it's worth. All right. So with the AWS tech in place now, you know, let's look at what it would take to really scale the servers out for all of use at Netflix. Um, so if we start actually by thinking about uh, a management plane for this service, right? So all these artifacts that are being generated and created by different teams, we would first upload to our service. And so this management plane would effectively handle inter any interaction regarding sort of the initial puts and changes uh, to these artifacts within the system. Uh, so, you know, as the teams create these artifacts, they upload them to us. And the first thing that we'll do is basically unpack this artifact. You know, we'll parse out some metadata and say, look, uh, I'm going to create a record about this artifact and then go and store it in DynamoDB. Then after that, we'll go ahead and take the raw artifact in its entirety and then you know, dump it into S3. So this management plan then gives us a really easy way to kind of keep track of all the you know, quote unquote, prod ready builds that we know and care about. Now, the other half of the service is going to be the runtime plane, right? And the runtime plane is going to be the part of the service that actually handles the incoming requests from our clients. So uh, once all the prod ready builds are sort of uploaded through that management plane that we just saw, uh, our users would then come through Akamai, which would then forward that request back to us. And what we could do is then, based on that URL, say, hey, this, uh, this user, for example, is asking for a website at version 1. We would go to Dynamo and say, where is this artifact, right? And then based on that information, go back to S3, fetch the artifact, come back to the service, and within the artifact, since we've got that you know, dependency graph, we can then do that sort of on-demand traversal at this point in time. So while this works, it does feel a little bit clunky uh, and probably would provide for a pretty poor experience from the user's perspe perspective, right? Because they're sitting there waiting for us to go to Dynamo, then go to S3 before we can do anything at all. Um, all the while, they're probably sitting there you know, in the browser with a spinner or something like that. So instead, I think what we can do is probably add some extra metadata inside of our DynamoDB uh, metadata to facilitate sort of the priming of artifacts within the system. So after uploading, instead what we can do is ask teams to then go and actually, quote unquote, activate a particular build, right? So you may upload like n artifacts into our system, but then say you only want to activate that last one. And by effectively uh, sort of activating a particular build, all we do is set a flag inside the database that says, hey, look, this is a build that you should be supporting um, right now. Like this is a a build that you may be taking um, traffic for very, very soon. And so once that build is activated and that flag is set in DynamoDB, um, here's really where we wanted to make use of that streams feature. Uh, as the flag was set, effectively DynamoDB could stream these updates back to our runtime servers, and it would say, look, here's the list of all the artifacts that you should be supporting right now. Uh, and based on that information, we could then go to S3 and basically prime the service with the artifacts that are being asked for. Uh, now, the thing with uh, the streams, unfortunately, was that at the time that we were setting up the service, probably uh, you know, two, two, three years ago or so, um, the streams could not be directly consumed by the Node.js client. And so what that meant is we had to create this sort of uh, intermediate Kinesis stream, which meant setting up some more infrastructure. <laughs> so I think ultimately, uh, sort of in the goal to reduce the amount of footprint that we needed for such a mission critical service, we opted not to do uh, streams at that point in time. Uh, instead, we went with uh, poor man's push and uh, decided to do polling, right? Uh, so what we did was set up a background thread here where basically our service was periodically polling DynamoDB and saying, hey, give me the list of active stuff, right? Uh, and as that list comes back, we do the same thing and prime the service with the artifacts that we need. Um, so that way, you know, when our users do come through uh, Akamai to get the JavaScript that they want, you know, the artifact is already live in the service, and all we have to do really is just do traversal and traversal of the graph and send that bundle back out. So there was one minor problem with polling, however. Uh, so here's a graph showing our instance counts kind of growing under a particular scaling event, right? Um, because we were polling on sort of a background thread, that means our DynamoDB read unit counts had to scale based on the number of instances that we had uh, in production. So 
scaling by the number of instances we had deployed rather than, say, you know, by RPS or throughput or any other metric. So as a result, what that meant was that there really wasn't a sane way for us to scale our read unit capacities, right? Um, and in the worst case of, like, of say, a massive scale-up event, um, we would probably exceed our limit and then get throttled and then you know, go into sort of a, a death spiral of sorts. Um, so to solve this problem, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy for us. Um, ultimately, like, we, we kind of played around with different ways. Maybe we could dynamically you know, update those read counts. But um, ultimately, we just decided on pinning super, super high <laughs> to basically um, get the read units uh, high enough for what we needed. Um, which is not great, but fortunately, I think since then, DynamoDB has landed uh, auto-scaling for uh, your read and writes. So that means you, know, you can just check that box, and then um, as your uh, read usage goes up, um, it will scale your, your needed capacity. So to quickly kind of circle back on our choice to use DynamoDB here, you know, it's worked incredibly well for us, primarily, primarily because it's such, so well-suited for our particular use case. Uh, polling works great in, in this case, too, because we are backed, uh, fronted, rather, by the CDN. Um, so, you know, while regents do have to scale with our instance counts, um, our instance count is actually somewhat mitigated by the fact that we have CDN caching. You know, if we sent all traffic back to our origin, then uh, this might not have scaled as well. Uh, so most importantly, though, here, I think, is um, when using a in a single solution like DynamoDB, you, know, you want to make sure that you set a, and use a good partition key um, and make sure that you, know, you understand the partitioning behavior for your specific solution. You know, um, picking a good partition key ensures that you know, you're going to get even distribution you know, of your workloads, um, which is super important to avoid hotspots. Um, and this is especially important if you're doing stuff like on a per request basis. Now, uh, if, lastly, if there is one thing you have to do, you know, it's make sure that you read the, the limits and the best practices guide. Like, I found this um, super helpful because uh, you know, a common, I think, thing that people kind of get bitten by as they start using that MODB is like, realizing that once you've exceeded the workload for a particular partition, um, what they'll do is split that partition, but it's only just the exceeded partition that gets splits in two, you know, it doesn't redistribute all of um, your keys. Um, so that is one of the gotchas that you may want to be aware of as you, you know, choose this as your solution. All right, so what about operational resiliency then? Uh, from a feature perspective, it certainly seems like we've got all that we need now, um, but a service is no good if it's not available, right? Uh, and the truth is, when we talk about availability, it's almost always an issue at your own tier, right? It's a, usually an issue within your own code. But assuming for a moment that you know, we've hardened the service and built it you know, to, to the specs that we need to, um, let's talk about what it means then to uh, be available if and when S3 and DynamoDB go down. So uh, who remembers uh, February 28th, 2017? All right, uh, I see some of you. Um, so this is the day that S3 went down uh, in US East. Um, and I, I think I can spare everyone the negative headlines here. Hey, Amazon. Uh, um, instead, let's focus on the positive headlines, right? Um, so this is one of the headlines that we saw. I think, I think this was a Polygon or Verge. Um, and I'm just going to read this here. In the internet's darkest time, people are finding solace in Netflix. Um, and uh, let me tell you, it was pretty awesome to see this headline, you know, because it means that we did something right. Uh, you know, we made sure that we were resilient to AWS failures, um, even for something as stable as S3. So how did we make this happen, right? Um, as you saw, like, we depend on S3 to serve all the JavaScript packages, and without JavaScript, your UI can't start up, right? Um, so how were we able to survive this? So what you may know is Netflix runs in three AWS regions. Um, and as with most services within Netflix, we are resilient to AWS regional failures. Um, so if any one particular region fails, you know, we're able to kind of shift that traffic over to the remaining regions and continue taking traffic. Uh, what this does mean, though, is that you know, all the stuff that we just looked at in terms of the metadata and the artifacts that we stored in DynamoDB and S3 uh, also need to be available in multiple regions um, in case a particular region had a failure. So what this really meant was that we needed to replicate this information into multiple regions. Uh, and it turns out it's not really straightforward. Um, you know, the discussion was originally started as like, look, we've got a single source of truth, and we need to get this into multiple regions, right? Uh, 
as we kind of went down that path, we quickly found out that actually there were a lot of gotchas, right? With S3, for example, you know, you could replicate only between pairs of buckets, um, but you couldn't do uh, transitive replications, which meant that if you were to say replicate from A to B um, and then try to replicate from B to C, anything in B that came from A won't get replicated to C. Um, so that was kind of like, a, okay, well, that's not going to work great for us. Uh, we ran into similar problems with DynamoDB here as well, where you know, the solutions for kind of uh, propagating your data into multiple regions were just kind of clunky or not as real time as we would like. I think you know, they offered some CLI command tools that you could run and you know, it would like back it up to S3 and then restore it back into you know, another region. It's like none of this was going to work for us um, at, at the scale that we needed it to. And so we figured you know, maybe through tooling, we could get that desired behavior uh, by simply treating each region completely independently. And so what we did was we built an SDK fronting our service. So this is the management plan that we were looking at. So when users came to upload artifacts to us, we would effectively say, hey, behind the scenes, we're going to transparently upload your stuff or take actions against all three regions, right? Um, and what, what that meant was uh, you know, each region was fully independent and a fully working system in its own right. And we took this approach because cross random replication was pretty difficult and fraught with you know, a lot of issues. And for us, it was actually a lot easier to just kind of keep each region completely isolated. Uh, incidentally, uh, this approach actually did unlock one interesting feature for us, uh, which was the ability to basically do regional rollouts of JavaScript, which we weren't able to do before. Um, you know, typically using a CDN, once you push out a particular asset, it's available globally. Whereas here, we had the ability to kind of like dial that um, from one region to the next. Uh, this may also be well known at this point, but you know, Netflix. Uh, we employ an army of monkeys for our chaos, te for our chaos testing. And each monkey kind of you know, is designed to create problems within your system uh, and your application by just you know, breaking stuff on purpose. Uh, and we do this so that we can be prepared for real world problems. Uh, so an example here would be you know, like latency monkey, which you know, arbitrarily creates uh, latencies in your requests. We've got chaos monkey, which just goes and kills instances just for fun. Uh, and then we've got the big guy in the back there, um, chaos Kong. And um, he, he, he's the one that's, that's really fun because you know, his job is to destroy entire AWS regions. So he's going to come in and then basically just kill US East, right? And so gone, um, basically. We've got nothing left there. Uh, and so um, you know, this might seem surprising to you, but we actually do this pretty regularly, right? Like we'll just walk in on Tuesday and be like, hey, guys, we're doing chaos testing today, uh, which is pretty great. And we do this because we, you know, we want to be prepared for when it actually happens because you know, these things will happen. It's not like a matter of if, it's a matter of when, really. And by you know, doing these on a regular cadence, we can be prepared for when the real thing happens. So you know, rather than being like a, oh, crap moment, it just comes like, oh, all right, you know, like, carry on. It's uh, business as usual. Um, so let's see. Given that we have designed sort of codecs to be you know, completely independent within each region, what that means is we can kind of use DNS steering or what have you to basically point Akamai back at a different region. Um, and so what you see here is by you know, simply having DynamoDB and S3 um, in every single region, we can continue to service these JavaScript requests. Uh, if you can imagine that you know, if, say, we relied on a single source of truth here, where both DynamoDB and S3 were based out of US East, then effectively you know, redirecting traffic to these other two regions would not, would not help, right? Because without those underlying services, we wouldn't be able to get the artifacts that we needed, and you know, we would be uh, dead in the water. So um, with this kind of approach, we're effectively triply redundant. Uh, which is fantastic and you know, helps us sleep better at night. Um, and this is, this is the exact approach that actually helped us avoid the S3 outage in US East. Um, so you know, as you can tell, I was pretty happy about this. Like, I was grumbling all the way through, like, man, do we really need to do this? Like, if S3 goes down, the whole internet's going to be on fire anyway. Um, and it turns out that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so you know, looking back uh, you know, about uh, a year from, from, from when this happened, like, uh, I think we were pretty stoked about um, the work that we put into making this happen. So obviously, we did a lot of testing, you know, hardening of the system as it pertains to AWS and AWS dependencies. But you know, what about our own application, right? Um, how did that scale out? So, uh, talking about you know, what we need to support, at first it seemed pretty straightforward. 
for a production-like environment, we thought, hey, you know, for any given team, at most, we will probably support you know, three to five maybe active artifacts at any point in time, right? You'd have the current production build. You would have you know, a production next, probably, like a, for, for a rolling red-black deploy. And then you might maybe have like, a couple canaries that you're running out there for testing or whatnot. So you know, it didn't seem that bad. We thought like three to five artifacts, they're all JSON. We could probably just store it in memory for fast access. You know, 16 gigabytes seems more than reasonable, right? Uh, and so that's what we started with. And what we found out was uh, as, you know, our teams started using the system and, you know, pushing it to its limits, what we found is, uh, you know, they're using it for pull requests, for CI, for, you know, functional testing, for pretty much everything you could think of, you know, re effectively replacing all of their existing workflows by using the codex system, um, which is great because we got the adoption that we wanted, but it also meant that you know, we were having to host something like 400 plus artifacts in memory at any one given point in time. So amazingly, uh, we used up all 16 gigs of, of memory. And so we looked at our instance types and we're like, well, you know, just, just throw some hardware at it, right? We've got 32 gigs. Let's move to 32 gig instance. Like, that should be more than plenty, right? Uh, and within a week, literally, we were up to 800. So I was like, all right, um, you know, We've got more instance types, like 64, surely, surely it should be enough. And yeah, no, um, within another week, we were up to 1,600. And so I think you know, it dawned pretty quickly on us that as a service, like our teams are really going to use as much as we can possibly give them. And we need to come up with a way to really make this scale much better uh, than what we currently have. Uh, so it was almost like we needed a magical solution. You know, what's cheap, plentiful, and fast enough? And if you thought memory was the case, like, yeah, that's true, but uh, apparently not cheap enough. Um, so the correct answer here is, is disk, right? Um, we actually had a ton of disks that we weren't using, so like, why not use that perhaps as a secondary cache? And so that's exactly the approach that we took. And what we did was pull in uh, LevelDB into our service, which is a file system-backed database. What that meant is we could effectively store things into LevelDB and then say, look, uh, LevelDB has its own sort of in-memory cache, and as it exceeds that in-memory cache, it will just write stuff out to disk. Um, and so this worked out pretty great, right? Because you know, disk space is a lot cheaper than memory. It means we could effectively store as many artifacts as we had disk space, uh, you know, which, is, which is pretty awesome, right? So at this point, uh, we're not, no longer limited by the instance types that we have in terms of memory space. So problem solved, right? Well, we deployed the fix and found that we pegged our instances, right? And I was like, all right, well, this is great. Um, it's kind of confusing because this wasn't a problem previously. So you know, why were we all of a sudden seeing you know, high CPU usage? And it turns out that we introduced a problem uh, by introducing level DB. So being good engineers that we are, we went to gather some data. And we captured some flame graphs uh, from our process. Um, so I, I think probably a lot of you folks have seen these before, but um, for those who haven't, the flame graph is basically a way for us to capture you know, what your process is doing. So what we'll effectively do is sample the process every you know, n seconds, uh, and then get a sense of like, hey, what is the process doing at that point? I sample it, and then you know, after a sample period, you kind of combine it, collapse it all together, and then see what exactly you're spending your time doing. Um, so you know, looking here, we kind of see that we've got this big chunk of like 68%. Like clearly this is, this is the problem. Um, so wh what are we doing here? I'm, I'm gonna kinda <laughs> blow this up for you. And it turns out we're just spending all this time parsing JSON, right? It's like, great, um, thanks Jason. And uh, while we previously, the problem was that previously because we kept all these JSON artifacts in memory, we only had to parse them once on startup and then we'd be good. Um, but now by sort of introducing this caching layer, what it meant is that each time we hit a cold cache, Level DB would have to pull a file off disk. We would have to parse the JSON, right? And um, by introducing Level DB, we actually changed the runtime char characteristics of our service. And so while we could, you know, store more artifacts now, it meant that we actually took a hit each time one was fetched from disk. So no surprise here, but you know, JSON parse is pretty slow. Um, and it's blocking, and this is pretty disastrous for a single-threaded uh, runtime like Node. And since you know, blocking JSON itself meant that pretty much any time we were parsing JSON, we couldn't really service requests, we couldn't respond you know, to other things that were happening within the system, and this directly impacted response latencies, uh, you know, and then you know, all of our teams and our customers would get mad. So uh, you know, 
was not a good situation to be in. And we had a couple thoughts here, right? And one was we probably ideally want to you know, move to a different sterilization format, you know, something that's perhaps more effective uh, or more efficient, really, in the long term. But you know, short of going to something like binary serialization, you know, we thought maybe there's a more practical solution here in the short term. You know, rather than kind of drown ourselves in a giant format migration, uh, you know, we thought, hey, maybe just doing something as simple as an LRU uh, would help us solve our problems, right? So as we pulled artifacts in from disk, we would store them you know, in their post-parsed format in this uh, in an LRU that sat on top of LevelDB. Um, and just that meant as you know, we hit cold artifacts, as they were pulled in, we'd replace the ones uh, that were cold, and we would evict the cache and keep it fresh as needed. Um, what that meant is effectively we only took that JSON parse hit for uncommonly requested artifacts. So we've got some graphs here that kind of show what this ended up looking like. You know, we, we kind of filled up that LRU, um, used up all 16, you know, downscaling back to the 16 gig instances, but um, reusing all of that extra memory for our LRU. And uh, here you can kind of see like our CPU utilization dropping, you know, to, to practically nothing here. You know, we see the entire fleet is sitting at like less than 5%, um, which is great and exactly what we wanted to see. And you can actually also see, you know, our average response times here dropping to practically nil. Um, so as you can see, you know, it's kind of scaling. Our response latencies were scaling with the traffic um, because as things would get activated, you know, we pull them off disk. You spend that time parsing, um, and then with the RU in place, like you know, that's how we kind of achieve those super, super uh, fast response times. Uh, so the truth was, after all this, like we were pretty much done with Jason, but you know, Jason quite wasn't quite done with us. Um, and we started noticing that you know, our management center, this is the place where people upload into our service, uh, was kind of crashing, right? So we've got this uh, metric here that shows every time our process um, goes down. And so this is like really strange because the management plane is not even the runtime plane. It's not customer facing. This is really only used by our developers. So what was going on? And uh, as it turns out, you know, um, we were seeing this stack trace before the process went down. It's like a range error in valid string length. It's like, such a cryptic sounding error. It's like, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, the only thing we're literally doing here is just parsing JSON. Uh, you know, and doing some further research here, and by further research, I mean Stack Overflow, we see this incredible quote here from, I think, one of the developers on the V8 team, and basically quoting, look, there is a 512, you know, megabyte limit here for a single string, uh, because, you know, that was the limit of the heap size then, so why would you ever use something more than 512 megabytes? Uh, <laughs> and that was because what happened was the artifact sizes we had were getting so big that they were actually exceeding, you know, 512 megabytes when they were serialized, and boom, like, there's your problem, which is great. Um, so eventually what we had to do was kind of move to a streaming JSON deserialization format, uh, and that kind of helped us, like, not have to worry about, like, parsing one giant chunk at any point in time. All right, so building codecs to kind of work for Netflix scale wasn't quite easy, and certainly we stumbled a whole lot, um, both on the AWS front as well as, you know, scaling our own service, but nobody ever said standing up a new service was easy, right? Uh, so as we kind of wrap up here, you know, just want to kind of share some of the things that, you know, keep us up at night. So as we talked about using a active flag, you know, to move things into the support window, right? Things are activated, that means our service has to support it. We never really talked about how we move things out of the active support window, right? How do we know when it's safe to actually deactivate a particular build? You know, and it's actually kind of hard for us to automatically know because, you know, the, the traffic that we see, that we see at origin is actually just a traf a, a sort of a fraction of the traffic that is seen at the CDN, right? Um, because with the CDN sitting in front, they're actually taking the brunt of the traffic. And so the reality is that this, this is a highly manual process for us right now. Like, we have to go sort of, you know, take a look at the client-side metrics and say, like, you know, which versions are actually being asked for and requested by particular versions of the client. And that's how we can ultimately decide, look, yeah, this, uh, this version has now been phased out in favor of a new version, and we can deactivate this and remove it from our system. Of course, as we all know, manual things never scale well, and so we're actively looking at ways to see uh, how we can make this better through, you know, perhaps heuristics of some sort, looking at um, client-side metrics and a combination of RPS at the CDN. Now, the big elephant in the room here, really, is, you know, why we 
didn't use existing open source bundlers, right? Uh, there's a ton of other solutions out there. And the reality is that when we started building the system, it just, the functionality that we needed didn't exist out there, right? Um, however, uh, you know, things in the JavaScript world move extremely quickly. Um, and so, you know, as we continue to kind of work on this project, we're probably gonna investigate ways to see you know, if we can pretty much package all the stuff that we built here as like a Webpack plugin of some sort and you know, maybe like bring that to the community. Like that, that's something that we would you know, love to be able to do at some point. Uh, now with the ongoing concerns out of the way, um, these last couple slides are really just gonna be about takeaways. And so the first is you know, to really, don't be afraid to challenge uh, common convention, right? And you should feel comfortable doing that uh, you know, as you need to, you know, taking risks, breaking ranks, um, and for example, for us here, it was like really challenging that idea of like static bundle generation, that challenging the idea that that was the only way to do bundling for us. Um, and so while it was common convention, it simply just didn't work for us. Uh, secondly, don't assume you know, anything, anything about your service or you know, what your users, how they're going to be using your service, right? And, especially don't make assumptions about you know, the scale of what your system is gonna to have to service. Certainly for us, you know, kind of thinking that you know, the 16 gigs of memory was gonna be more than enough for us uh, was, was causing a little bit of pain and probably some churn for us and our customer teams that you know, really didn't need it to happen. So that said, while you do want to optimize that system, you know, make sure you're not doing any premature optimization. Uh, this is super, super important because you can't really effectively optimize a system until you understand its characteristics, right? And as engineers, I think we're frequently uh, trying to tackle performance problems before they exist. Like, you know, we'll say things in pull requests like, dude, just move this function over here, it'll be like 100 times faster, um, which, is, which may be true, but I think the thing is, once you actually deploy a service, you usually don't know where the bottleneck or you know, how that bottleneck is going to appear um, until the whole thing is kind of running and in place. So complex systems like this have lots of ripple effects where you know, minor little things can trickle throughout the system. And of course, as a corollary to the previous point, you know, when you do begin to optimize and debug, like please, please, please use the scientific method. Uh, you know, make sure you gather your data, make sure you understand the problem, you know, formulate a hypothesis for this uh, so that you, know, you have the correct data to sort of inform your next path, your, your next choice on how you're gonna optimize this system. Um, finally, test it, make sure that you know, the problem that you're solving, that you're actually solving the problem that you thought you were solving. Uh, and if not, then repeat and, you know, continue as necessary. Like, I really can't emphasize how important this is because I think, you know, trying to optimize a system by guessing at what you think the problem might be is extremely ineffective. Uh, and it inevitably kind of leaves everybody frustrated because you're just kind of like throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. And while understandably, you know, not everybody has to deal with Netflix scale, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't engineer things to be fault tolerant, uh, especially when you're setting up new applications or uh, services. You know, think about the consequences of what happens if your service happens to go down, right? What happens to your customers if your service is not available? Uh, what happens to the services that depend on you if you're not available? Um, and you know, the, the hardest question probably is like, is there a financial cost to you not being available, right? Like these are all really hard questions and if you don't like the answers to those questions, um, then it's probably an area that you want to invest in. Uh, lastly, Netflix scale is challenging. Um, you know, so much of what we do is well known to everybody, uh, but when you do it at the scale that we have to, like known problems can kind of evolve and morph into more complex and more challenging problems. And so while it can be really hard, you know, it's hard in a great way and I think, you know, it keeps us on our toes and as engineers, isn't that what we're all really after? It just makes it more fun. Uh, so these last couple of slides are just um, credits for all the amazing Lego photos that um, I've taken off Flickr. Um, you can check them out. And that's it. Thanks, everyone.